It's good to be back again, almost at home. Good to be back with you all here at uh, Galilee. It's uh, like your brother said, um, one of my favorite congregations and just so hung out um, with you guys. It's, it's a real joy. It's a privilege. Nothing at all difficult about um, coming here to minister to you. And uh, we trust that we'll have another wonderful time uh, together here. Uh, let me invite you immediately then to join me on your visual aid as we're going to use that to guide us in our, in our studies as we try and forge ahead um, dealing with our subject. Let me just line it up and make sure that I get all that away and you can see your screen uh, very clearly. So to fix your GPS, you're at Galilee Gospel Hall. And if this is not where you intended to be, then you're mistakenly in the correct place. So stay with us until the end, and then you can go your merry way. But we right now, we are very happy to have you, and we are going to introduce our subject. I want to thank the elders again for the opportunity here at Galilee to be addressing the subject matter at hand. We're going to be looking at the doctrine of homartiology, which is the biblical study of sin. And I'm your Bible teacher, John Fraser. Sin is man's only disease. The only disease the human race has ever seen is sin. That might sound strange to you, sounds new to you, but this is a scientific fact. The medical fraternity is not going to surrender or agree with this total. There are individuals there that will agree that sin is only is the only disease that man faces. All other issues are symptoms. You treat this right and all the others disappear. You notice all those who work in the field of human services and um, caregiving whether dentistry, whether it's the dietitian, whether it's the nurses and the doctors, you don't have these professionals in heaven. And the reason why we don't have them there is not only because we don't need them, but there's no sin. There's no sin there. And that's why those symptoms are not there. But the reality of sin is earthbound. It's a problem here on earth. You don't believe me? Check the motivation why we want to go to Venus, why we want to go to Mars, why we want to go to the moon, why we want to get off this planet and go somewhere else. The fact of the matter is, though, is that we are a carrier of this disease. So even if we, no matter where we go, we, we have a habit of not leaving it. And it's not only that we pack it in our luggage, it has a way of not leaving us. Because it, it's engraved in our nature, body, soul, and spirit. This disease spears no part of the human constitution. And this is not something that like our sociologists and our politicians are ever going to agree on. But if you get this disease under control, all the others will fall in place. And that is why our study is a biblical study. And I just want to talk to you a little bit of how we do these studies in terms of, one, the content of the in information and the methodology, the method. How do we put such a thing together? The subject of the study of sin is not unique in any way. So let's talk a little bit in this session about Christian theology, how, how we formulate that and how we get information about these various doctrines, about these various body of truths that, that really constitute what we call Christian theology. The word theology then comes from a combination of two Greek words. Let's take the prefix first. It's the Greek word theos, and it means God. And then you have the, the, the suffix, which is logos, and it means a word, a thought, a reason, or a study, or a discipline. 
it's it's an area of inquiry. And so from that we get theology, theology, which is basically a study of God. Theology then can take on a unique or a broad meaning. Theology means the study of God. And in a moment, I'll show you where we fix that up to make a distinction. However, that is the meaning in its broadest sense. Anything related to the scriptures and to what God revealed in his word would come under theology. Christian theology, Islamic theology, see? Anything relating to the Christian faith centered around the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you use the word theology in the broader sense. Then when you are referring to the study of the person and work of God, his attributes, the triunity of God and so forth, that becomes theology proper. But from the moment you enter a, a theological institution, a Bible institute, a Bible college or seminary, you are going to study theology regardless of the branch and the individual um, discipline or body of truth that you might be addressing immediately. Like us, we are looking at sin. The word theology also takes on a more technical and specialized meaning, like I said before. Christian theology, on the other hand, refers to the body of truths or doctrine, which relate to the Christian faith. Within this framework are several areas of specialized branches of studies, which are also called theology. There is the, the theology of salvation. There is the theology of Christian family and so forth and so on. Once you're gonna use the Bible as the resource from which you source your truths and collect them, then that becomes uh, basically theology. And like I said, if you're studying the person and work, nature of God, that becomes theology proper. That's so they refer to, to it in, in Christian theology. Now, let me walk you through some areas of specialty in Christian theology that to me, the typical believer has not been taught. We have not exposed you to it. And we need to do that because it's important. Stay with me in this introductory session and you're going to realize that there are some truths that you need to expose yourself to without enrolling in a Bible Institute. And I'm going to walk you through that. All right. So you have the broad umbrella title, Christian theology. Okay. Under that, there are some different area of specialty. For example, historical theology. Historical theology to me is one of the most important branches of Christian theology that has not been discussed and brought to the fore as much as we should. Let, let me just basically describe for you what historical theology is all about. Historical theology is addressing the issue as not just what we believe here at Galilee Gospel Hall in 2020. It's all right and good for us to document, have a statement of faith that the leaders put that together, what's our theological perspective and so many things that we need to teach, you know, Sunday school, you know, youth meeting, you know, ministers, adult Bible class, ministry meeting, all of that. But there's an important aspect of theology. It's that which lies between the Bible, what is in the Bible, and what we understand today as we speak. So we would call what we believe today, let's call that current theology. And then there is biblical theology, what the Bible says. Between what the Bible says and what we believe lies historical theology. Now, why is that important? Because you want to know that what we believe today has the legacy and the support of the history of the church. You want to know that what we believe is not something creative, innovative, 
or a new kid on the block. And that is why historical theology helps to guard us and to protect us from being creative and innovative in our doctrines. Now, today, believe it or not, the, the church has neglected that. And I love to illustrate and compare that in such a way to basically somebody who is involved in an accident, okay? You were not there, but somebody told you about the accident. But somehow, you think you're qualified to tell the person what happened, even though you turn up after the accident. You know anybody like that? Well, isn't that basically what we have with the journalists, most of the media houses in the world, is that if you were to tell them what transpired and you witness an accident, you know, they prefer their concocted version of what happened. Even in court, sometimes lawyers do that. But then they are trained to do that. They will tell you, I put it to you. This is what happened. Now, you have to be very careful. Very, very, be very careful how you try to override the testimony and the ministry of somebody who is witnessing about something they experienced. You, you, you really don't want to try to tell somebody what transpired when they, in fact, witness something. If they witness something quite lightly, their argument and their belief should be far more reliable and we should be more trustworthy than what we personally want to believe. And a lot of us get into trouble like that, especially when it comes to theology. Why? Because the believers before us, the generations of believers before us are closer. Their lifespan and chronology happen to be closer to the men who received the revelation. You perhaps have heard, and let me bring this on the screen and read this, and then I share something with you that I know you have heard before. This branch of study within Christian theology concentrates on the inquiry and investigation of Christian doctrine in their historical development. You must have heard the, the term church fathers. Now, the church fathers doesn't mean that they gave birth to the church. That's not what the title really means. The church fathers, and there are three groups that we're not going to get into, but I'm just going to tell you basically who the church fathers are or who they were. You see the apostles? The apostles happen to know people personally. People who they appointed as elders. And right upon the disappearance, right after the apostolic era closed, the church fathers were the men, the only group of people who personally knew the apostles, heard them explain things and answered questions that's not a part of the inspired text. Many of them remember how the apostles clarify things for them one-on-one -on -one in a men's group. When they showed up at a Bible study and they were Q&A and they would have answered that, but it's not part of the written word of God. That information you can understand constituted a part of the history of Christian truth, though not written. And so those men, when the apostles disappeared and when that year came to an end, these men constituted a very important link in understanding, one, not only what Christians believe, should believe, but how we should behave. And to add to that is how these church fathers understood the apostles and their writings. Believe it or not, it's far more important than we realize. What they wrote, what they recall, and what was recorded by the church fathers, definitely not inspired. But they help us to understand the interpretation of the apostolic writings. So historical theology is not to be ignored. In fact, this is one of the major flaws and failures 
in Pentecostalism. And in Pentecostalism and the child to which they gave birth to called the charismatic movement is that Pentecostalism is not old, you know, really it's not. The church existed 1500 years without anyone believing, claiming that the sign gifts were with them. The church fathers made no reference to these things that Pentecostals hold on to today that become indispensable in their belief and in their Christian practice. Now, historical theology help us, help us to realize that, hey, wait a minute. Those men and church leaders who knew the apostles never thought that the sign gifts were here to stay. And so there's an absence of any reference to things like that. But apart from just the issue of Pentecostalism, is the issue of how we understand the doctrine of sin and how the church limited, limited their sources of information. For example, if we were to address the issue of the 66 books of the Bible, and those groups that have additional books called the Apocrypha, to which you sometimes would hear our Rastafarian friends talking about the Maccabee Bible. There's no such thing as a Maccabee Bible. It, there are two books or three books, first, second, and third Maccabees that are in the Apocrypha. So they are extra biblical books that the church fathers never use nor recognize as canonical. So today we don't use them. And we're going to look at that next week too, in terms of what will be our sources, our source of information as we look at the subject of sin. Now, historical theology examines how the church arrived at her beliefs and how she responded to error throughout her history. That is where the church councils come in important now, where certain doctrines and truths that are pertinent to Christian theology, how they were addressed, how they were resolved when church leaders met. Interestingly enough, the first church council was held as recorded in Acts chapter 15. And that church council was cheered by James the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is that first church council, and the Apostle Paul was in attendance, can you believe it? And Barnabas with him. They were very uncomfortable, of course, of having the Apostle Paul believe that perhaps he was a spy, etc., etc. But it was Barnabas who encouraged them that this man is authentic, this man is genuine. Now, at the first church council, hear what was addressed. The relationship between Gentile converts and the Old Testament laws. Even though today, the Seventh-day Adventists seem to don't read Acts chapter 15. That they, it was addressed, what bearing, what authority, how should the Gentile convert treat the Old Testament? Well, that was resolved at the First Church Council where the apostles guided by the spirit of God concluded two things. One, they should abstain from meat that is where the animal's life was strangled out of it. In other words, the animal did not shed its blood and so the blood remained in the meat. And so we should not eat blood today, by the way, the blood of animals. And when I say eat, I mean include drink. It's prohibited. It's one of the carryover laws from the Old Testament that was resolved at the church council. The other one, of course, is circumcision and all the other demands of the law should not be brought to bear upon new converts. That was resolved and settled. And Peter seemed to have forgotten that. And so the apostle Paul had to rem remind him in the book of Galatians. But be that as it may, the point is, you see the history. It just happened that the first church council took place while the inspired apostles were still around. But we have had subsequent church councils throughout the history of the church. Councils that deal with the, the, the Bible, canonicity, 
whether or not we're going to recognize the, the Apocrypha, the consulate Carthage address that and throughout the history. So historical theology is really, really important. History is important to us. Somebody rightly observed that the person, our nation, that forgets his history is bound to repeat the past mistakes. We see that in families. I remember my professor in that taught me one of the part of Christian counseling. Very dear man of God shared with us that he doesn't drink wine. He doesn't drink any drink that has alcohol in it. So of course, before we even ask, he explained, it's not because he's anti-alcohol. He explained that alcoholism has a bondage in the history of his family. His grandfather was an alcoholic. His father was. And he explained, knowing that issue in his family genes, as a, as a young man and as a man of God, he decided not to even taste it because of the history of how it works in his family. No, that's an act of wisdom. When you know the history, you can apply knowledge and demonstrate wisdom. So history is so important. You don't want to come up with new doctrines. You can find new way of saying it, saying old things and so forth. But the content should be rooted first in the inspired text and with the history of Christian theology. Then we have biblical theology. It represents a method and an approach of inquiry in the systemization of a specific subject matter within a particular book, portion, author, or category of the Bible. Let me just walk you through. For example, you could have a theology of Genesis. In other words, treating how the book of Genesis address certain issues, okay? And you stay within the book of Genesis. You can also have a what you call a theology of the Pentateuch the first five books of the Bible. You stay within the confines of what Moses wrote. You have Old Testament theology, which is a part of biblical theology. You can have New Testament theology. That's biblical theology. You have Pauline theology. And Pauline was not the wife of Paul. It's just the description of Paul's writing we call Pauline letters. They're written by Paul, all right? So let Paulie not get excited and then pull Paul into the argument too as well. But the fact of the matter is when you stay within an author, Johannine theology is basically within the writings of John, how John likes to use the word believe and faith and love and truth. He just loves those four words. You could trace that in the gospel of John. You trace that in his epistles. You can even trace them in the book of Revelation. So you notice there's a unique signature of John with words and concept and how he used them. So that, that's basically what we mean by biblical theology. Old Testament, Pauline, or New Testament. You can have a theology of the family in which you look at what the Bible has to say about the family. You would perhaps begin with how God established the male as the head and the wife as the help meet and the how the husband was husband before he becomes a father. Now, that is important sociologically in a society because when we reverse that and the male becomes a father first and then he becomes a husband, they are sociological effects. When we violate God's order and God's chronological sequence, see? So a man marries a woman and he becomes a husband. And notice this, consequently, he becomes a father. Consequently, after that vow. And it has a lot to do, of course, in the context in which children are brought and brought up and so forth. So there are a lot of theology and different um, perspective. The theology of discipline, church discipline, or discipline among the people of God. Now we come to pastoral theology is another category. 
Watch that. It's the branch of the Christian faith that seeks to bring together all the biblical data or data which relate to the subject of offering soul care, spiritual direction, and the transformation of God's people. Caring, shepherding God's people is not confined to the church. Shepherding is an Old Testament art and craft that God calls so many shepherds. In fact, in the Old Testament is the prominent professionals that are called into service of God's people. God has called more shepherds as prophets and leaders more than any other profession. That should tell us a lot. So you have what you call pastoral theology or shepherdology, this biblical study of guiding God's people and how that art is developed and how we can improve our leadership in our churches of God's people by offering pastoral guidance and instruction. The primary objective of pastoral theology is to examine within the context of the Bible those passages with, which address shepherding with the intent to help increase our competences of those who are engaged in pastoral responsibilities. And I'm not using the word pastoral in terms of who we refer to as pastors today. I am using it as leading God's people and not as a, an office, but the exercise of the gift of taking care of God's people. Then we have systematic theology. Systematic theology is the most comprehensive method of inquiry in Christianity. The major emphasis of this approach is to systematize all data found in the Bible into specific categories our and our subjects. Now, this is very, very important. When you're finished putting together, systematizing all the verses in the Bible and the references, no verse is left out. Every verse falls within one of the major areas of systematic theology. Is that not important? I think so. And I'm sharing this with you to let you know, when we have finished, if we were going to do a comprehensive study of homartiology, the biblical study of sin, we would leave no verses, no passage, no, no reference to sin unless we address it. So if we were to do that comprehensively, that would lessen the questions. In fact, you would help us find some answers. Because in a good study of the scriptures, when you find a good answer, it produces another question. I love that. Good Bible teaching and study, good biblical answers produces more questions. Jesus on one occasion addressed the disciples. If I recall, it's in the Gospel of John. Could be chapter 16. And Jesus said something to them and the disciples, like they, you know, just remain silent. And Jesus said, how come I just said that to you and you guys ask no question? That's powerful to me because then I'm saying to my, myself, oh, Jesus was scared of questions. In fact, he expects questions to be asked. He anticipated. That's why, while a lot of people wish they had lived during the time of Jesus, that they had spent time on earth with Jesus, I always beg to differ. I never wanted to be around when Jesus was on earth at all. I understand you and your spirituality and all that. You would like to have met him. No, I just permit me to be different. Here is why. You would read in the gospel something like this. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said unto them. Are you serious? You want to be around somebody like that? No, I, I don't even muster the courage to try to formulate a question. And Jesus intercepted my thoughts and exposed it. No, 
I am too personal and private a person. That's all right. I wait until I get to heaven. The scariest person for me that crossed my path was my mother. That woman, God bless her soul, she's in heaven. She would look at you and say, don't even think about it. It's somebody almost like Mother Riley. I wonder if my mother and Mother Riley were twin sisters. They just look on their children and x-ray and tell you, don't even think about it. Well, that Jesus would make me uncomfortable, if you see what I'm saying. But you have to put all the information in the scriptures, all the verses, into a particular category. That's what it means to systematize. All passages have to fall in a category. That's why we have Christian theology, sometimes referred to now as systematic theology. Here we go. There is theology proper, which is the biblical study of God. What we mean by that? What God reveals about himself. Not what you think about God. Not what I think about God. Not the God of the philosophers. Not the God of the skeptics sitting under the old oak tree. But the God who initiated revelation. Revelation is not an invitation for us to speculate. Biblical revelation is not the collection of polls. And that's why in my study and teaching ministry, I do not conduct polls. I really don't care what most people think about Jesus or think about sin or think about life after death. Or think about same-sex marriage. I have no interest in what society thinks about it. What I'm interested in is what God says about it. Because when God speaks, not are the king's horses, nor the king's men, for he can never be out outnumbered. So this study is going to be rooted in scripture. Scripture and scripture alone. So we begin with the theology proper. Then you have bibliology. That makes sense, right? The Bible. The study of the Bible. We are currently in our church in New York at Hillcrest Gospel Chapel. Are bringing the curtains down. And our study of how we got our Bibles. Over a year we have been working on that. It's important to understand the nature of the Bible. How it is revealed to us. Peter tells us that the Bible did not come through the minds of men by the will of man or man's creative genius or intelligence, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now that changes everything. Because while some people are distracted by Paul's past and with his personality, which all of us have, you understand that it was the Holy Spirit who breathed, breathed thoughts in his mind, who moved his hand and controlled his pen to write what he wrote. So please, when you're discussing the writings of Paul, don't try to undermine it by telling me he was a male chauvinist or he had problems and issues with women. I need you to understand what Peter said, that holy men of God spoke as the spirit of God controlled their hearts and their thoughts. So we just don't say Paul says, really it's God who says. Study the Bible, it's the final authority. Behold, it is written. Powerful things here. Then we have angelology. The biblical study of angels. And no sooner are you going to realize that they are holy, obedient angels. And they are unholy, disobedient angels. Sometimes we call them falling angels. Because they're fallen from their original holy state. They're in a state of rebellion. Now, the Bible has quite a lot to say about angels. But not all your questions about angels are going to be answered in the Bible, for the Bible is not a textbook on angelology. We learn from scripture that there are different angels, angels with two wings, angels with four wings, angels with six wings. 
And no one knows if you have more than that because the Bible is not, not about angels. They are God's ministering spirits to the creature that is made in his image and likeness, humankind. And so we have some information. Then you have the study of demons. Now, some people put demonology under angelology, and that's okay. But for me, demonology is different. Why? Because angels are different from demons. Angels have body. Angels have confinement. Demons don't. Demons are disembodied spirits. For example, quickly, you will never read in scripture, we have never read, and I don't think you will ever read it, that anybody was ever possessed by angels. Angels don't enter people. Demons do, though. Demons enter animals, forces of nature. So I make that important distinction, and some books in theology do. Then there's anthropology, the study of humankind, homo sapien, who we are, how we were made in the image of God. And no sooner you study that, especially you have to begin in Genesis, and you see how God made man to have dominion, etc., etc. You have got to ask yourself the question. You mean God made us like that? That's the way we were? Yeah. The forgotten story of our former glory is what I call it. So you have to ask then, how did we get here? What in the world happened? And that's when you come to the next relevant study for me, which is where we are. The study of sin. The study of the wreckage of the fall of man. The study of man's original damage from which he has not recovered as a, as a race of people. Homotheology, the biblical study of the disease called sin. That's where we are. Christology, the person and work of God the Son and the person of the Son of Man. Powerful, you know how in indispensable that is. Soteriology, the solution that God has provided for the human predicament through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the, the, there's an inseparable link between Christology and soteriology. There is no salvation that is not wrapped up in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. For there's only one mediator between God and man. There's only one name, one solution that heaven has issued for this vaccine for the human virus called sin. That is the biblical study of salvation. Pneumatology, the study of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Another fascinating study. We just completed that at one of your churches there in Jamaica. And what, what a time we had and the study of the person and work of the, Holy, of the Holy Spirit. Ecclesiology, the biblical study of the church. And when you hear people referring to the church in the Old Testament, you know they are not studying the scriptures right. For Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. That was yet to come, and it started on the day of Pentecost. And so you study that in scripture, and you realize it's different from Israel. The church is different. We are a part of the church. So that's ecclesiology. Eschatology. It means the study of last things. Interestingly, that's what the word literally means. Eschatos, last. Last things. But when we study eschatology, we study prophecy. The issue is really clarity. There are far more prophecy in the Bible than what we would study today. He said, Peter, what do you mean by that? Some of biblical prophecy have become history. They are fulfilled already. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. See, that was Isaiah's prophecy. Today is history. So it's, it's an interesting study. But these formulate the body of systematic theology or Christian theology 
I believe they are to be taught in every church that is linked to the New Testament. There should be no New Testament church or no New Testament believer who is not exposed to the body of truth because you will never be able to understand what God says about sin until you do a series on sin. No one verse in the Bible is going to totally address the subject of sin. In fact, if you don't do what we are doing, you're going to be confused because you have heard it said, as I know I have, all sin is sin. And it's hard to oppose that. But that's not exactly correct. For the Bible says there's a sin unto death. And there, not all sin leads to death. What does that mean? See, we're going to look at that because we are doing a series. So it is not true that all sin is sin. In fact, if that were true, you would not have Leviticus, nor would you have Exodus. Because in there, God instructed Moses how to judge different sin and crime in Israel. Certain sins were to be atoned for in a particular way. Certain time restitution has to be made when certain sins are committed. Certain times execution has to be done when certain sins are committed. So you see, already we know it's not biblically true that all sin is sin. It's like saying all crimes are crimes. Oh, no. You know, in every civilized society, you have high crime. You don't believe me? Just notice when somebody is arrested for a crime, look at the nature of the bail ban that is posted. It usually gives you a hint of the severity of the crime. So all of these we are going to refer to within the confine of scripture. But our focus is on the, what the Bible has to say about sin the subject of sin. Let me set up a pyramid illustration here to communicate which one is fundamental in our process in looking at the different body of truths or theology today. And I hope you're staying with me. For us, when we say you're a Bible-believing Christian, here's what we are saying. We are saying that the Bible sits at the foundation of your belief and your behavior. The Bible, not the Vatican, not headquarters, not a synod, not a committee, but the Bible. That is why the, the, the brethren have developed this addiction by asking questions, where in the Bible can I find that? The Bible has the final. In fact, that's how we respectfully discuss differences and disagreement with one another. We base that on the Bible, not on articulation, not on somebody's ability to persuade you, not in packaging, not in marketing, but in basing it on the scriptures. So the written word is the foundation. It sits at the base of the pyramid. Everything else must be based on that. So immediately relating to the written word of God is a theology we call exegetical theology. Now watch that big word. It just means that you are bringing out from the scriptures what God said in the original languages because that is important. Why? Human languages like our English Bible and translations, our languages, words change meaning, etc., etc. God, in His wisdom, gave the Old Testament prophets through dreams and different media His word in a language called Hebrew. Now, there are different types of Hebrew, you even have modern Hebrew today, all right. But the Hebrew that God revealed the Old Testament in, and a small portion in Aramaic, those are not languages that are used today. There's Hebrew, but not ancient Hebrew. God froze that 
type of Hebrew in time. Why? So you can't apply current meaning of words and confuse what God said with what the interpreter is saying today. Here's the problem we have. A lot of things preachers are saying have no biblical foundation, if you see what I'm saying. That is why so many of us gravitate and recognize the authority in the teaching of such Bible teachers as John MacArthur Jr., David Jeremiah, and these scholars who interact with the original languages, because that is important. After working with the original languages, now this is what we referred to earlier on, biblical theology. What does the Bible have to say about sin? What does Paul have to say about sin? We could talk about Pauline theology and sin, which we'll be talking about all of them. But I'm just showing you how we could look at biblical theology. It must be Bible-based. It's not where you interview philosophers and teachers and well, God forbid we would interview politicians about that. But the idea here, we restrict your inquiry to the Bible. And of course, I already told you about historical theology. How has the church historically treated these things in the Bible? Because since they are nearest and closest to the historical event, you really want one of them to show up as a witness, and they do in the writings of the church fathers. Then from that now, we gather what we call systematic theology. We just look at them. Theology proper, bibliology, the study of the word of God, how it came to us, and so forth. From systematic theology, we have three basic groups. And by the way, this is not exhaustive. I'm just illustrating to you how we put contents from the Bible together to present to you, thus says the Lord. There's dogmatic theology, and it doesn't mean what we think to be dogmatic means, but how different groups of churches formulate and understand certain things. And this is rich, again, from church history. We have that dogmatic theology, how they defend that. Apologetic theology, we know that. God has blessed us in our time with some very gifted uh, apologists. In our time, now we have like Norman Geisler. We have men like, uh, he just went to be with the Lord. Um, his name just slipped me now, but we have some, some, some great Bible teachers that God has raised up to defend biblical truth and to show us from scripture, and, and even in the area of human thinking, they help us to understand. Uh, R.C. Sproul is the name I was looking for. See, I just uh, had a res restoration of my memory. And then you have practical theology, practical theology. Did you know that there's a theology of business? Yeah, business theology. How you as a person want to start a business, how you use the scripture to guide you. Yes, there is such a thing as business theology. Then you have biblical counseling. That's practical theology. We talk about pastoral counseling or shepherdology. That's practical. Helping us to apply the word of God. All branches of Christian counseling then would fall under practical theology. Whatever we are doing is how we act, conduct ourselves in a biblical way or in a godly way. Okay, so homartiology then is the biblical study of the disease that have come upon the human race. And believe it or not, the Bible does have some interesting thing to say about this, this disease. This is the study of the most deadly and dangerous of all human problems. Is the biblical study of sin. For the wages of sin is death. That's Romans 6, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you don't want to be mischievous here to say to a short person, all have sinned and fall short or come short. You want to complete the verse. 
So you, you six footers are included. This is a biblical diagnosis of the number one killer of all times. And we are going to look at it. So when we come back in the next session, look at that word. Whoever could spell the word next as nest, he has to be a sinner. So you can begin to think about forgiving that one. We're going to look at the diagnosis, how the Bible diagnoses our problem. We're going to look at the biblical prognosis. What if we do not do something about that which have been diagnosed? The process is called prognosis. And then we are going to have the joy and delight of looking at the biblical prescription to sin. How God solved the problem. How he dispatched his only son from heaven, carrying the heaven's detergent to wash us and cleanse us from our sins. That if you will believe in your heart, and confess with your mouth that God raised Christ Jesus from the dead. You're saved and you're not only saved, you're safe. You're on your way to glory. So we are not only going to look at the disease, we're going to look at God's given prescription to the sin problem. So stay with me, stay with us. It's going to get better. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is truth, that your word is final, and we thank you that we have access to it. Guide us, we pray, not only in our Q&A, but ultimately control and guide our thoughts within the confine of your revelation. So we believe what you have revealed and that we never recover from your word, but always applying it to our heart. Not just for our sake, but for Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Everyone just say the truth.